morning. We're glad for each and every one of you that's here. You know, that last song they sung, that's the most important question that we could probably ask anybody this morning. Do you know Jesus? A lot of you might say, yeah, I know Jesus, but do you really know him as your personal Savior is really the question. Because if you don't, this is the opportunity you're going to have today to be able to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. He's the main reason that we're here today. We're here to worship him. We're here to praise his name. We're here to preach his word. We're not here to entertain. And, you know, we want God's spirit to flow. We don't want any, but any hindrance to, to the spirit of God. We want everybody to obey the Lord this morning and do what God would have you to do. If you have your Bibles and want to read along with us, we're going to read out the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis. Easy book to find, very first book in the Bible. Uh, we're going to start reading with the very first word in the 18th chapter. Uh, and this is the God speaking to Abraham. Uh, we've had a Bible study on the book of Genesis, and then now we're on the book of Exodus on Wednesday night. And... Uh, I tell you, I, I really like the book of Genesis. It's got a lot of uh, good uh, wisdom in it. Got things there that God would really have us to learn. And starting with the very first verse in chapter 18, it says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them uh, from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee from thy servant. Let a little water, water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to ye, your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make uh, cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto the young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and a calf which he had dressed and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure in my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child? Uh, which am old, is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So here we see that God had appeared to Abraham three times in the Bible and three times in the book of Genesis. It says that the Lord appeared unto Abraham. First time we see that God appeared unto Abraham was in chapter 12. And in verse 6 of chapter 12, uh, God says the Canaanite was in the land. Then he goes on into verse 7, and he gives a promise to Abraham. And he tells him, he says, your descendants shall I give this land. Now what he was trying to tell Abraham was, hey, I am the God of all power. I am the God that can do all things. He told him, I'm going to give your descendants this land. But the Canaanites are living in the land right now. And you say, well, how is he going to give Abraham land that somebody else occupied? But what he was really telling Abraham was, hey, I'm the God of all power. It doesn't make any difference who's in the land. 
It doesn't make any difference how much power that they have. It doesn't make any difference how fierce they are. It doesn't make any difference how well walled and well fortified their cities are. It doesn't make any difference how strong they might be. It doesn't make any difference how big the giants may be. He said, I am the God of all power. I'm the God that can do all things. And God's trying to tell us the same thing today. Too many times we limit God. We don't think God is all powerful. We don't think that God can do things that, that he tells us that he can do. And he's trying to tell us the same thing that he told Abraham. I am the God of power. I am the God that can do all things. It doesn't make any difference what the situation is. He said, I can do it. But too many times we try to limit God. We limit God because we think, well, if I can't do it, it can't be done. Well, you know, it's something that, that we've tried to do and it just didn't work. God says, I'm the God of all power. He said, if you believe in me, he said, I can do it. That's the reason Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He said, you are the God of all power. It reminds me of Elisha. To me, Elisha was, was, was a great man. Now, you know, we got a whole lot of great men, and all through the Bible we say great men, but I, I, I kind of like Elisha because Elisha wasn't anything but an old farmer boy. He was out playing on the field with 12 yoke of oxen. Elijah came by, and he called to Elisha. Elisha lifted his oxen, and he followed Elijah. And he was called to be the successor of Elijah. And he followed Elijah around, and, and, and he learned from Elijah. And then one day, God was getting ready to take Elijah home. Well, Elisha kind of knew something was going on. And maybe Elijah was trying to test him. He said, I'm going to go down to Gilgal. He said, you stay here. And Elisha said, no. He said, something's going to happen today. He said, I'm going with you because I don't want to miss what's going to happen. You know, that's a whole lot of time. That's our problem. God's going to do something, but we're not around to see it. We're not expecting anything. How many of you came to church this morning expecting God to do something? Most of us came this morning just playing, well, here it is, it's going to be 11 o'clock. We'll sit through the service, you know, and, and we'll go through the service. And we're not expecting God to do anything. God is an all God of all power. God can do all things. I hope when you came this morning, you came expecting somebody to be saved. I hope you came this morning expecting a blessing. I hope you came expecting God to do something for you. I hope you came expecting God to speak to your heart. Now Elisha said, oh, I'm not staying. He said, I'm going to go with you because something's going to happen today. No, and Elijah said, no, you stay here. He said, no, I'm not staying. So they went on down to Gilgal. Elijah said, I'm going to go across Jordan. You stay on this side. Now there was 50 uh, preachers there, 50 young prophets. You know how preachers are. They got to get their, get their two cents in. And they said, oh, said, you know what's going to happen today? Said, said, said your Lord, your, your, your Lord's going to be taken away. God's going to take him home. And Elijah said, you know, just keep your peace. And that was a polite way of saying, you know, just keep your mouth shut. I know what's going to happen. And he told Elijah, I'm not staying on this side. He said, I'm going with you because something's going to happen. He went with Elijah. Elijah went down to the Jordan. He rolled up his coat. He smoked the waters. The water parted, and they walked over on the other side. They got over there, and then when the chariot of God came to take Elijah home, Elisha was there. And Elijah had asked Elisha, he said, What is it that you want? What do you want? What's your heart desire? What's your, your great ambition? And Elisha said, I want a double portion of God's Spirit. Now, some people, I've read some people say that Elijah did 80 miracles in his ministry. Most of us, if God had asked us, now, what, what, what do you want? Most of us say, well, I know I can't be the man that Elijah was. So if I can just do one, I'll be satisfied. Now, if we was real ambitious, we might have said, hey, maybe if I could do five. Because I know I'm not the man that Elijah is. I'll be satisfied if I could just do five miracles. Maybe if we got real ambitious, we'd say, if I can do half as many 
If I can be half as good as Elijah was, I'll be satisfied. But Elisha said, I want a double portion. I want double of what Elijah had. And God gave him that power, and Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. Because why? Because he had the faith. He knew that he served the God who had the power. He served the God who could do all things. And he had the faith and he had the courage to step out on God's word and ask God for a devil portion. Too many times we sit and we don't do anything because we try to limit God's power. We think that we can't work. We think God's not the same God that he used to be. We think God doesn't do the things that he used to do. Let me tell you something. We serve the same God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the same one that was with Daniel in the lion's den. We serve the same God today. And he says over in the book of Malachi, he says, I am the Lord, I change not. I'm still the same God that I was then. And he was trying to tell Abraham in here in chapter 12, I am the God of all power. And what I say, I will do. Now he comes on up to chapter 17. And for the second time, it says that the Lord appeared unto Abraham. And he tells him there, he says, I am the God Almighty. I am Almighty God. He said, walk with me and be perfect. Now what he was trying to tell Abraham here was, I am the all-sufficient God. Because this, uh, when he said, I am God Almighty, I am the Almighty God, he was using a Hebrew word there that is El Shaddai. And El Shaddai means, I'm the all-sufficient one. I'm all that you need. He was telling Abraham that I'll be with you. And whatever it is you need, I'll be that for you. If you need strength, I'll be your strength. If you need power, I'll be your power. If you need nourishment, I'll be your nourishment. I'm all that you need. Too many of us, we forget that. We want everything else in life, and we want to shut out God. We think that we don't need God. Let me tell you something. The thing, the most important thing in life, the most needed thing in life is Jesus Christ. We need Jesus in our life. We need Jesus in our homes. We need Jesus to guide us. We need Jesus to, to help us. Because he's the most thing that we need most in this world. Most people say, oh, if I had more money, if I had a better job, if I had a better car, if I had a better house. But what you need most is Jesus Christ. And most people are trying to go through life without the most important thing, and that's Jesus. But God was telling Abraham, I am the all-sufficient one. I am more than you need. You don't need anything else because I am what you need. And he said, if you walk with me and you turn everything over to me and you just be a complete person, let me fill you and make you complete, you'll have all that you need. You know, that's one thing about God's people. God said, I'll fill your needs. I'll give you all the things that you need. But too many times we think that God has forgot about us. We think that God's not giving us what we need. Hey, let me tell you something. God knows what we need more than we do. God knows what I need before I even know what I need. And too many times I ask, and a lot of times he said, I don't answer your prayers because you pray amiss. In other words, you're asking for things that really you don't need. And I know what's best for you. And he answers our prayers in what he knows is best. And he was trying to tell Abraham there in chapter 17, I am all sufficient. I am all that you need. Then he comes up to chapter 18 here, and it says that the Lord appeared unto Abraham. What he was trying to really tell Abraham here in uh, chapter 18 was, I'm your friend. I'm your friend. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you. Tell you what, Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's our friend. And too many times we don't think he is. We serve an almighty God. We serve one that cares about us. He cares about everything that we do. He looks at our lives. He sees our problems. He sees our failures. He even sees our sins when we make mistakes. 
but he still loves us. Paul said that, that even while we were yet sinners, God commended his love toward us because he gave us to die for us. Even while we didn't love him, while we were in sin, he still loved us enough for Christ to die for us because he loved us. And he was trying to tell Abraham here. He said, I'm your friend. I love you. And he said, I promised you something. And he promised Abraham a son a long time ago. And Abraham hadn't had that son. It had been many years since God had promised him a, an heir. In fact, they tried to take matters into their own hands. And, and, and Sarah gave Hagar to him and said, Here you have a child by Hagar, and, and that'll be your descendant. And they had a child, had a son, and his name was Ishmael. But God said, no, this is not the one. This is not the chosen one. This is not the chosen seed. He said, I promised you an heir, and I'm going to give you an heir. And it says here that in chapter 18, it says when Abraham was 99 years old, that the Lord appeared unto him and said, I'm going to give you a son. Well, if Sarah was old too, and she heard that, and she laughed. She said she laughed within herself. Said, what, am I going to have a son here when I'm old and Abraham's old too? Hey, that's not that, that's not biologically possible. You know, that's just not the way things work. I'm too old to have a child. And God heard her life. And he asked Abraham. He said, Did Sarah laugh? Did she laugh because I told that you were going to have a son and she thinks that she's too old? And then he goes there into verse 14, and the very first part of verse 14, he asks a question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? If we don't get anything else this morning, I hope we realize that there's nothing too hard for my God. I serve an almighty God. I serve a God who is all-powerful. I serve a God who is omniscient, who knows all things. I serve a God that's omnipresent. He's here this morning, and I thank the Lord that he is here this morning. I thank that we feel his spirit, and his spirit flows. And I praise God for that this morning. I praise him for all the things that he's done for me. I praise him that he is the almighty God, and that there's nothing too hard for my Lord. He can do all things, but we try to limit him too many times. God, is, there's nothing too hard for God. Somebody, I've read someplace that there's, somebody said there's probably 30,000 promises of God in the Bible. Out of 66 books, 1,189 chapters, there's probably uh, 30,000 promises there for God. And my God can keep every promise that he ever made. God doesn't lie. God doesn't fail. He's able to answer all the promises that he made to us. When he said, I'll be with you into the end of the world, he'll be right there. He'll never leave you. When David said, you walk through with, uh, with me through the valley of the shadow of death, he'll be right there. When we face death, God will be there with us. He said, I'll never forsake thee. I'll never leave thee. He promised us, and I claim that promise today, that he'll always be with me. Whether I, I, everybody else forsakes me, God said, I'll be there. I'll be with you. Because God keeps all of his promises, and there's nothing too hard for my God. My God can do all things. He can answer all prayers. You say, well, God, I've been praying for a long time. God hasn't answered my prayers. God can answer all prayers. He said, you ask it in my name, and he said, I'll give it to you. He says, seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. My God answers prayers because my God can't lie. I read about an old lady. And she kept telling about how great God was. And that one of these days when she died, that she would go home to heaven to be with the Lord. And somebody said, how do you know? What if you come up and when you die, you find out all this is not true? You find that you die and all those things that you believed in, they weren't true. And you die and you've lost your soul. She said, I'll lose my soul, but God will lose more than that. God will lose his honor. And God will never lose his honor. I serve a God that can do all things. I serve a God who, who is all honor. And whatever he said, he'll do. There's nothing too hard for my God. He'll keep all of his promises. He'll keep all the things that he's done for us. God will answer that because nothing's too hard for my Lord. My God can do all things. He can do them all. There, there, there's nothing that, that is too hard 
for the Lord to do. We limit him by what we think. We think, oh, God can't do this. God can't do that. I'll tell you something. God knows everything about us. God knows what we need. And God's able to fill all those needs. He heard the children of Israel down in Egypt. And they cried. And he told Moses, I've heard their cries. He hears your prayers. He knows what you're in. And there's nothing too hard for my God. You say, well, I prayed and I prayed and God just didn't answer my prayers. Hey, God answered the prayers. I prayed, I tell you, I pray for people all the time. And I've already got it in my head how I think God ought to answer those prayers. You ever do that? You pray and you think, well, now, God, I, I prayed now. Now, this is what you're going to do. Now, God, God's going, you're going to work it out just like this. And you lay it out just like you think it ought to be. And then it doesn't happen that way. And you say, well, God, you didn't answer my prayer. Hey, God works in his own ways. And sometimes the ways of God are mysterious. And a whole lot of times I can't explain why God works in the way he does. Sometimes I can't explain what God does. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't love me. That doesn't mean that God doesn't care. And it doesn't mean that God's not able to do all things. Because there's nothing too hard for my Lord. God answers prayers, but that's not always the way that we want to. I pray that, that, that I'll be able to see good again. Well, he's not giving me 20-20 vision. And I still have problems sometimes seeing. If I don't have a whole lot of light, I have a whole lot of problems seeing. But that doesn't mean God's not going to make me a sight perfect. I pray sometimes that I can walk without a limp and don't have to wear this brace. I still limp. I'm still wearing a brace. That doesn't mean God's not going to answer my prayers. He may not answer them until he calls me home, but then I'll walk those streets of gold with no limp. I'll see the, the glory of God without any glasses. I don't have to worry about it because nothing's too hard for my Lord. He can do all things. He answers all promises. He keeps all promises. There's no promise that's too hard for him. And there's no problem that's too hard for my God to solve. Now you say, well... I don't have any problems. Well, I tell you what, you're a better person than I am. If you don't have any problems. Because I've got all kinds of problems. Even the people in the Bible had problems. I think about poor old Jacob. He had 12 sons. He was a man of God. He was one of the patriarchs. He had a, one son that kind of committed incest. He had two sons that really destroyed the whole town, murdered them all. He had one son that, that slept with his own wife, with Jacob's wife. He had all kinds of problems. But God said, I'll still be with you. God said, I'll still come and I'll, I'll help you. There's no problem that's too hard for my God to solve. How many times have you had financial problems? Uh, I think most of us probably do. If you're not, God's blessed you. But God can solve those financial problems too. God can help you. God can solve your financial problems. You got family problems. God can solve those family problems. He may not solve them just the way that you think he ought to. And he may not solve them just the way that, that, that we think that everything ought to work out. I've had people come, I've had people come to the altar and they say, Oh, I've got family problems. And I've come and I've given my life to the Lord. They get up and they think everything's going to change. That all of a sudden the family's going to be reunited. That everything's just going to be hunky-dory again. And when it don't happen, you don't see them again. They don't ever darken the doors of the church. Doesn't mean that my God can't do it. You got to have faith. You got to have faith that God can do it. How many of you come here to pray and when you get up, you go back and the first thing you think, well, now what am I going to do? Is that praying with faith? T. God says we pray with faith believing and nothing's too hard for my God. You go to the doctor, I, and I go to the doctor. You know, I, I get scared. I don't know about you. I get scared when I go to the doctor because I'm almost, I'm afraid of what he's going to tell me. And usually I can tell me, tell when it's going to be a good report and when it's not going to be a good report. And a lot of times you go and you hear, though, something we don't want to hear. Let me tell you something. God knows that. Just like he told Sarah here, I don't care if you are old. I don't care if Abraham is 99 years old. 
I don't care if it is a biological impossibility that you have a child. There's nothing too hard for me. There's no disease that's too hard for God to cure. God can cure all of it. The doctors might look at the reports and say, well, this don't look good. He may read all the lab results and says, this don't look good. But I tell you, nothing's too hard for my God. He knows the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what the facts may say. He knows the truth, and there's nothing too hard for my God. You say, well, there's a lot of things that he don't do, that uh, don't cure, uh, cure, a lot of diseases he don't cure. T. I used to really, I, I never could understand that until I was down in Bristol one day seeing the doctor, and I saw a guy that used to come up here at Jenkins and sell, um, he's a, sell, sew things to the x-ray department. His dad was in the hospital down there, and he said, my dad's dying. He said, I, I prayed that God would cure him. And he said, but they told me to go call my brother, that he's going to pass away. He said, I prayed for his cure. But he said, I just realized something. God has just immediately cured him. He's taken him home, and he's going to be cured. He's going to be healed. And you know, maybe God doesn't cure all the diseases here on earth, but one of these days when he takes us home, he'll cure all diseases. Because he said, there'll be no sickness in heaven. There's no problem that's too hard for my God to solve. I thought about when we were having the right revival. People say, well, you can't have revivals anymore. People just don't come out. You can't get people to come out to a revival. I don't care what it is. And we try everything. We try the advertising. We try to, to do this. And we try to offer this. And we try to do all these things. And people say, oh, you just can't do it anymore. Can't have revival anymore. I tell you, my God can send a revival anywhere, anytime, any place. There's nothing too hard for my God. He can do all things. You know, there's no soul that's too hard for God to save. You may be sitting here this morning and you think, God can't save me. Let me tell you something. God can save you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you thought. I don't care what you're thinking right now. God can save you. God can make a difference in your life. How many times have we prayed and prayed for people and they don't come and we say, well, God's never going to save them. They're not going to get saved. I'll tell you something. There's nobody that's too hard for God to save. I think about the, over in the second chapter of Mark. It says that Jesus was preaching and said that there was a paralytic man. He had four friends. And they said, if we can just get him to Jesus, Jesus can heal him. And they picked that man up and they carried him to where Jesus was at. Now, when they got there, it says the crowd was so big they couldn't get in the door. And I'm sure that there was probably one in, in the crowd, and there's probably one of the four that said, well, boys, this is as far as we can go. We've done what we could. This is all that we can do. We've carried him here. Now, we can't get in. We can't get him any farther than this. That's all we can do. And, you know, sometimes that's the way that we are. We think, hey, this is all we can do. I've tried. Didn't work out. That's all I can do. Hey, there's nothing too hard for my God. The other said, no, there, there's another way. See, there's more than one way to do things. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. But you've got to have faith. You've got to believe. The other three, they probably said, no. Come on, there's another way in. We'll, we'll, we'll get in. Some of them said, oh, the crowd's too big. You know, I don't want to do this in front of the crowd. Have you ever felt that way? You know that the Holy Spirit is drawing but you say, I don't want to go. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm afraid what people's going to think about me. The crowd's too big. I'll, I'll do it next time. I'll do it next time. What if the next time doesn't come? What if the Holy Spirit doesn't draw next time? You need to come when the Spirit draws. What if the men said, hey, the crowd's too big. Let's go. We'll try it again some other time. They said, no. 
we got to get our friend because we care about him. We care about him. And there's people here this morning that care about you. If you're not saved, if you don't view Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's people here that care about you. There's people today that are praying for you. There's people today that want you to be saved. They care about you. And they do anything that, that you ask them to so you would accept Jesus Christ. And these four men said, no, let's don't give up. So they climbed up on top of the roof. And I'm sure there's somebody in the crowd said, well, you know, it's never been done this way. And I'm so sure there's a lot of people today that says, hey, you, you've changed the services around. You've changed them around. They're not like they used to be. Hey, I don't like to get in a rut. Sometimes I think we get in a rut that, that you could just be able to tell what time it was, what, what we were doing in the service. You knew that after we sowed it in the congregational songs, it's bound to be about five after or ten after. And after we took prayer requests, it's bound to be 15 or 20 after. Well, after they had the special singing, it's probably, you know, about um, 11.30, 20 to 12, something like that. And you can just about tell what time it was. Hey, sometimes we need to get out of the rut, don't we? Just because it's never been done that way before doesn't mean that it can't be done that way. And they said, hey, let's take him up on the roof. And I'm sure there's somebody said, well, no, wait a minute now. We've never done it this way before. That didn't stop them. They cared about their friend. They were cared about him because he couldn't walk. And they, they could, took him up there. They started taking up the roof. You imagine people sitting down there and I probably stuff started falling down on their head and everything because, hey, they were up on the roof. They was taking off the roof. And probably somebody said, hey, wait a minute now. Sit down here and count the cost. Let me tell you something. I don't care what it costs. For one soul to be saved, it's worth everything that we spend. You know, when you give your tithes, you think, hey, you're just doing this to pay the electric bill and all that. No, what you're doing when you give your tithes and when you give your offerings, you're giving money toward the kingdom of God to see somebody saved. That's what it's for. It's so that somebody can be saved. So they took off the roof and they lowered the man down. And, you know, and over in the second chapter of Mark and in the fifth verse, it says, it says that Jesus saw their faith. It doesn't say he saw the man's faith that they were lowering down. It says that he saw their faith, the faith that they had. And then he said to the man, your sins be forgiven you. It was because of the faith of their friends. And that's what we need to do. There's nothing too hard for my God. There's no soul that's too hard for my God to save. And we need to get on fire for doing things for God. We need to get a burden on our heart for our loved ones and our friends and, to, and work to try to see them saved. We need to try to get them to Jesus. We need to try to get them there so Jesus can touch them. And it's because of our faith that they'll be saved. And can you imagine? Here they carried this man there. And after the service and after that, Instead of four walking, carrying one, here come five, probably jumping and praising God because their friend could walk again. A man that couldn't walk, but now he could walk again. And probably everybody that they seen, I, I say that man said, look at me, I can walk. I couldn't walk before, but now I can walk. And let me tell you something, today you're walking in sin if you don't know Jesus Christ. But you can go out the door this morning and you can shout, I'm a different person. I walk differently than I did when I came in this door because you know Jesus as your Savior. There's nothing too hard for my God. He can do all things. He can do all things. Don't limit Him. He can save you. He can work in your life. He can do all things if you've got faith. Is there somebody here this morning and you're lost? Don't let anything intimidate you. You need to come. Because the most important act is your soul. The most valuable thing that you've got is your soul. 
You can replace automobiles, you can replace houses, you can replace money, but you can never replace your soul. So we're going to ask you to stand this morning. If you got something on your heart, even if you're a Christian, but you've got a problem and you've got something, you need to come and you need to lay your problems at the altar because nothing's too hard for my God. If you're lost, you need to come and accept Jesus because nothing's too hard for my God. Won't you come as they sing? Oh, 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 oh,